Hello everyone and welcome back. Um, I hope you're enjoying the uh, morning's content so far. I can assure you we have lots more to come. Um, it gives me the great pleasure to introduce our next panel. Um, we have uh, Digital Therapeutics, Creating and Commercializing Clinically Validated Innovation. What a title. Um, I'm really looking forward to this panel as I'm sure you are. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand you over to the uh, moderator, Dan Kendall, who'll be able to give you sort of the rundown um, of who we have participating um, and he'll be leading the discussion today. Great. Becky, thank you very much. As Becky said, I'm Dan Kendall. I'm the managing editor of Digital Health Today and the founder of Health Podcast Network. I'm really pleased to be your moderator on this panel session entitled Digital Therapeutics, Creating and Commercializing Clinically Validated Innovation. So I'm joined with three great leaders in this space. I'll just introduce them briefly and then give them an opportunity to talk about their relation to digital therapeutics and their involvement in the industry. We have Yaziah Brinkman, who's the co-founder and co-CEO of CaraCare. It's a companion app for a, health, a happier and healthier gut. He's based in Berlin. Thanks for joining us. Lauren Lee is the global head of digital health for Ipsen. Uh, she's based in Chicago right now, but normally based in Boston, this meeting in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And uh, Megan Coder, who's the executive director of the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. She's based in Washington, D.C. and is normally based in an airplane lounge somewhere on her way to some, some other event when events can normally happen. And Zach Henderson, who's the chief commercial officer uh, of uh, Gluco.com. He's based in Charlotte right now, but normally based in Palo Alto, a beautiful part of the world. So thank you all for joining me and for being a part of this panel. Uh, as I said, I want to first of all give you an opportunity to uh, introduce a little bit more about your company. So if I could just quickly go around the room. Yesaya, we'll start with you and, and talk about your involvement in relationship to uh, digital therapeutics. Thanks, Dan. Um, yes, we, are, we focus on digestive health. So everything around gastroenterology. This includes diseases like irritable bowel syndrome, IBD, GERD, and other um, digestive diseases. And we actually empower those patients with our app-based solution. And that is medical device status in Europe. And um, yeah, now distributed to employers and health plans in the US and um, prescribable soon by doctors in Germany through this so-called DIGA process. Yeah, as I said, um, yeah, based in Berlin, um, yeah, small team, um, backed by um, great investors and um, yeah, happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Great, very good. Thanks very much, Isaiah. Uh, Zach, if I could go to you next, can you just give us a little bit of an understanding about your company and its relationship to digital therapeutics? Sure, Gluco is a digital health and remote patient monitoring company that is in 26, 26 countries around the world in 15 languages. We have historically focused on diabetes but are now moving into other comorbid conditions because of the overlap. And our entire solution enables the patient to provider connection in a both in-clinic and remote uh, manner. And as we've all seen with COVID and other trends in the marketplace, being able to connect to your physicians remotely is more and more important than ever. Great, thank you very much. I'm interested in finding out more about your, your pivot to include uh, more disease states and more conditions. So Lauren, if I can go to you next, can you explain your role and your organization's relationship to digital therapeutics? Sure, yeah. So Ipsen, uh, where I work for, is a global biotech company that's uh, headquartered in France globally, but in the US, we're headquartered in Cambridge. So from a pharma point of view, our digital team that I head up um, works on leveraging technology, including digital therapeutics, uh, to bring value to our patients, physicians, and payers beyond our drug. So often the opportunities we look at are in combination with our drug portfolio, which focuses on oncology, neuroscience, and rare diseases. Um, so super happy to be here. Dan, I'm a fan of your podcast. Megan and I cross each other in many conferences, and uh, I think Gluco and Kara are very exciting companies in the, on the scene, so really honored to be here. Great. Well, thank you very much. And last but not least, Megan, can you explain a little bit about Digital Therapeutics Alliance? I know we'll have a chance to dive in deeper through the conversation, but just give a bit of an overview about the organization itself. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, so Digital Therapeutics Alliance, we are a nonprofit trade association that has about 40 member companies spread across 15 different countries. So everything we're trying to do within DTA is really focused on let's 
first, when we first were founded, let's define what this industry is. Let's identify products that are software-based, that are generating and delivering clinical interventions to patients, making a medical claim to prevent, manage, or treat a disease or disorder. So we're really focused on that area and subset of the broader digital health industry. Uh, as we've grown, we've really started to look at how do we educate the broader population? How do we help payers, policymakers, clinicians, patients understand what these products are, what to expect from them, how to use them, and really how to ensure that they're at that level of quality that all these other clinically validated therapies are. So digital therapeutics has been my life and will continue to be. Um, I love where the industry is going and there's so much potential. So um, again, thrilled with everyone else to be here today with you, Dan, too. Excellent. Well, Megan, I know you've done a lot of interviews on a very a variety of podcasts. I heard the one you did recently with Eugene Borahovich. Uh, so I know listeners can find out a lot more about your organization and how you're working to pull a lot of the different stakeholders together to really advance this uh, important area of health innovation. So since we're here to talk about commercialization, I'd like to start with uh, Zach and Yesaya to talk about you know where you are in terms of commercialization. Gluco is a name that's been around for quite some time. As you mentioned, Zach, it started off with uh, diabetes background. So can you give us an idea of uh, your success to date, sort of the, the path that you uh, started in the early days, maybe just a couple of minutes to explain where you are in terms of the commercialization, both regionally as well as from a product perspective? Sure. So the, the founders of Gluco uh, were persons with diabetes, PWDs as we call them. And their main uh, challenge was they would, uh, with a, a pen and a piece of paper, write down in log books all of the readings that they took uh, throughout the day. And then they would try to look back and figure out what was the appropriate adjustments they needed to make. And it was very manual and time consuming. And this is uh, you know, over 10 years ago. Uh, so Gluco was created to uh, initially solve that problem. Uh, the other issue is if you think about any endocrinology clinic in the patients and the proliferation of devices and pharmaceutical products, there's myriad combinations. And so um, any one solution is very single threaded. So what Gluco does for the endocrinologists and the patients is it integrates all these devices and the data into one portal so that the, pa the patient and the physician can see across the entire population what those common readings are uh, and help to uh, improve the care of the patients. Uh, so we've evolved that over uh, you know, time to include a merging with a company uh, that was very similar in EMEA uh, called Diacend. And now we're one global platform across the 26 countries. Um, at the end, tail end of last year, we kept getting more and more requests from our current clients, which were providers, health systems around the world to expand into comorbid conditions because of the overlap with the diabetic population. Uh, and as many people know, diabetes is the largest chronic care condition there is, but there's these other comorbid conditions that um, overlap uh, quite a bit and are important to understand for the care of the, the patient. So we're aggressively moving that direction uh, and pushing out our uh, capabilities, not only through organic product development, but also through partnerships with other digital health and uh, telemedicine companies. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And diabetes is something actually very close to my heart. I have family members that are affected by that. Uh, so I've been tracking the progress of your company over many years. So something that's not as, as often talked about, Yesaya, is uh, around gut health. Uh, diabetes is certainly very prevalent and, and in the headlines and something that may be uh, spoken about more frequently in social circles. But uh, tell us about where your product is, uh, maybe a little bit of background, how you got into focusing yeah. on gut health, but also where you are from a commercialization perspective. Yeah, definitely. So, so first of all, many people actually ask me this question, okay, um, how did you find out about this niche digest niche digestive health? And I always have to explain, it's actually a really huge um, disease area with like a cluster of different diseases that all have um, yeah, prevalences um, that are yeah, between 10 and 20% when you take IBS and, and um, GERD, for example. Um, so it's really under, um, un underrated. Um, we actually started five years ago um, and had the dream that everyone with digestive diseases could actually have access to our digital intervention, which is based on a mental health intervention and medical nutrition therapy as a combination. 
And uh, we actually called it in that time five years ago or, already software as a drug. Um, so now we call it digital therapeutics, but in that time um, we had this term even on our website. Um, but um, in that time, payers both in Germany and in the US weren't ready yet. Um, the regulatory framework was not right. And um, so we then actually started really focusing on building a lovable product for consumers directly. Um, and um, we're quite successful with that. So we've generated over 700,000 um, yeah, users so far with um, our um, direct to consumer channels. And then over time, we actually saw and identified more openness by health plans, by the German public payers and by employers in the US. And um, so we then um, slowly moved more to the B2B2C direction. Um, we also have great partners helping us with that. So um, one, for example, is Sanofi. We have announced this partnership yeah, around one year ago. We have launched in the UK and Germany a combination of our digital pill together with one of their new IBS drugs. We've placed this in different pharmacies and I think over 3000 in Germany, for example, um, and um, some in the UK, Tesco, Boots, for example. And we have um, co-marketed this to, as a holistic program for people with um, irritable bowel syndrome. And um, we actually believe that um, yeah, COVID actually accelerated this whole um, shift and the, the kind of payers are currently really warming up and, um, and um, yeah, become more open to, to reimburse um, solutions like ours. And I think specifically the Digital Care Act in Germany is a really good example for that. And currently many other nations are watching the German process, the first so-called DGAS going live and being prescribed by many doctors in Germany already. And I think this will be a big trend internationally to, um, yeah, to, to learn from that. Yeah. Okay. So just for anyone who's, who's tuning in here. So the DIGA, the, the, the Digital Care Act was approved, what, a couple of years ago now, uh, referred to as DIGA. You actually are uh, approved through DIGA, right? And available through DIGA. Is that right? And uh, this, this quarter, exa exactly. But this we quarter. are one of the first uh, yeah, DIGAs in Germany. Okay. And, and Zach, I know that, that you know, when we talk about innovation, the science and the technology is really important, but ultimately there needs to be a business model around that. So one of the things I want to make sure we all talk about is about how do we innovate the business models to make sure things are happening. But you mentioned before we started recording around the fact you're working towards getting that DIGA approval. So tell us a little bit about that process that you're following and, uh, and, and what that means for an organization like yours, which is uh, on the smaller size, but well-resourced. Yeah. Well, yeah, Josiah really um, hit on it that the, the DIGA example in Germany and there's other examples. Uh, the CMS in the United States has now specific uh, CPT billing codes for remote patient monitoring and chronic care management. France has what's called the ATAP program. Uh, Belgium is considering a program. Taiwan's uh, national reimbursement just went live for digital health. So we, we see across all the countries we operate and the ones we're considering this global trend towards reimbursement for digital health digital therapeutics and telemedicine. And the reason is simple, uh, even though they may be paying more for the months when the patient doesn't come into the clinic, what they're doing is raising the standard of care because they have say 12 interactions with the patient over the course of a year versus for instance in diabetes, it's three, maybe four times is the standard. And so the public and private payers are realizing that it's a much better investment to keep a person with diabetes uh, in range, as they call it in the, in the therapeutic area versus having a spike and that person might have to go for a you know, $20,000 hospital visit. Uh, so it's a, it's a global situation that, as Josiah mentioned, it's actually accelerated the adoption of these programs uh, because of COVID. And we're all learning that it's more efficacious to engage more frequently with our care providers, whether uh, it be in person or remotely. And thus that's improving the efficacy of whatever the solution is. So the business model is fairly uh, simplistic. They're paying for performance and the performance is a better outcome for the patients, lower complications, lower hospital visits, uh, et cetera. So if I could go over to you, Lauren, with Ibsen, uh, we've heard what's happening in terms of the sort of startup mentality or the, the early stage business mentality and how they're going about creating these solutions. But, you know, you're with a biotech company, you're the global head of digital health. 
Um, how are you seeing things uh, shape up in this industry? Because I have to say, you know, I've been in this industry long enough to know that pharmaceutical companies were a bit of a laggard uh, in terms of coming to this sort of innovation fold. Uh, and I remember reading a Moby Health News article years ago, probably 2011 or so, sort of calling the pharmaceutical giants out for, for not getting more involved sooner. Um, and uh, Brian Dolan wrote that article. It stuck out of my memory thinking, okay, now is the point where this is going to change. And we've seen a massive change uh, in terms of the investment and the focus. But So tell me where your organization is sitting and what you're seeing from the biotech side as you look at digital therapeutics. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Dan. Um, I think you're you're right. Uh, we've all seen how the life science industry in many ways have lagged other industries in terms of digital innovation and digital transformation. Um, now, the past few years, we're seeing more and more, and like everyone have talked about, COVID has uh, really propelled and accelerated that process. Um, across the board, we see a lot of activity happening, of course, in the clinical development side, right? Leveraging technology for decentralized clinical trials, leveraging digital biomarkers for more objective continuous measurement, preferably also at the patient's convenience at home, et cetera. Uh, on the commercial side, which is where we primarily look at digital therapeutics for, I'll say it, it is also being slow, right? We, we've seen some high-profile announcements, Sanofi's been pretty active, Roche, uh, Novartis of the world have made a couple announcements with different digital therapeutics companies um, like Novolentis or Hepify Health, um, but I think by and large, uh, the specific case use cases have not been super clear. Um, I do think that that's very viable uh, commercialization channel for digital therapeutic companies, right? Usually we see um, a digital therapeutic company to go through either employee uh, assistance programs, EAPs or health plans, or some of them have a direct to consumer uh, strategy. But I think partnering with pharma to provide a solution in combination, conjunction with the therapy, like what Josiah was talking about, I think that's a very viable path. And there is increasing uh, interest and appetite on the pharma side for it. Uh, so in our case, like I mentioned, Ibsen's therapeutic focuses are in uh, oncology, neuroscience, and rare diseases. And uh, for example, one topic uh, we've we've been interested in and exploring is a topic of mental health. We know mental health is a common challenge for patients of many conditions, but particularly for something like cancer, right? It, it's a serious diagnosis. When you get it, it, it's a huge shock. My grandmother had bladder cancer five times, so my family have gone through that journey, the emotional ups and downs for the past 15 years. And then when you combine that with some of the cancers that we treat, which are rarer, in nature, then you don't even have the community of a larger cancer like uh, prostate or breast cancer. Um, and there are unique challenges and frustrations along the patient journey um, and the, the life flow of the patient and families that cause a lot of stress and anxiety. So that's an area, for example, we look into and digital therapeutic has been just blossoming and blooming in behavioral health. Uh, so. I think there is a lot of opportunities like that. Um, that's what just I talked about comorbidities, or Zach talked about comorbidities of the conditions that we treat. So if we can offer more value to patients beyond just our uh, drug itself, that's something valuable to us. So are you still looking at it then, Lauren, as, uh, as something that you can use in combination, digital therapeutics you would use in combination with your molecule or has the, the thinking uh, advanced to the point where actually uh, from a pharmaceutical life science perspective, is there actually viable uh, business opportunities to actually create standalone digital therapeutics that perhaps work independently of your molecules? Yeah, I'll give you my, uh, my honest uh, view. I That's think all we want. Companies, you, you, have, um, you have two CAMs. You have one CAM who are very, practical, very, you know, tangible results oriented, and it's all about combination. It is all about how can we add value to our drug portfolio. 
And then you have another camp where we're visionary who talk about, you know, in the future, we can have a dedicated business unit for digital solutions, right? We want to uh, be a really a differentiator using digital. Um, I think there are more and more people who talk about that, but I think the reality is uh, just recognizing as an industry, we are not the best at doing product development. We have not been the best at gathering uh, close patient insights. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of context and regulations in, in place that, that lead to that. Um, but I, I, I think at this point in time, I don't think a pharma company is the ones who are going to hire the best programmers, who are going to hire the best UI UX designers, who can really do the best human-centered design. So uh, I, I think that future is interesting. I think it is still far off. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for that, that candid answer there. That's all we want here on this discussion. So Megan, I want to come to you next in terms of what you're seeing. So D Digital Therapeutics Alliance uh, launched internationally. You started it uh, actually, I think when you were based in France at the time, you were living in France, you launched it in November, 2017 in Berlin, uh, where, where Isaiah is now based. Uh, and you know, you're now based in Washington, DC. It's almost you know, three and a half uh, going on four years old. So, so tell me, uh, you know, before COVID, we'll talk about what's happened because of COVID and what we can expect going forward. But how have things progressed in digital therapeutics during that time? Yosiah mentioned that it was called uh, what did you call it? Yosiah, it was it was software as a as a drug. Was that right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we've seen even the, the the way that we refer to digital therapeutics evolve in a very short space of time. So tell me a little bit from your perspective, what you're seeing uh, globally and how you're seeing companies like Ipsen, as well as early stage businesses like uh, like Chiracare and, and Gluco evolve in this space. Well, that's a question I could take a while to answer. Um, I think in you short, won't. Though. We're going to cut you off. Though. I know. Keep, keep you I sharp know. for the audience here. Indeed. OK, so I'll do my best. Um, we have seen a lot of evolution and I think it's easy to say um, a lot of these things are like it's a tremendous growth. It's a significant opportunity to see what we're doing and evolution has been um, unprecedented, but it almost does feel like that. So I don't want to use too many big words, but in the sense that we have seen a new industry be created that is running along the same lines of looking at randomized control trials and looking at regulatory oversight and keeping all of these notions around the same rigorous pathways that all these other modalities of therapies have been developed, but now using that in the digital sense. So we've seen companies start um, with one single indication and then expand the other indications. We've seen companies be created and be developed uh, and scale with incredible speed uh, that I had not heard of three and a half years ago. So it's been interesting to see that. I think one of the things to build on one of Lauren's points though, when we started, we had more of this notion around, you are a digital therapeutic company and you sit here as a kind of a startup. You are a pharma company and you deal more with helping scale. We have really seen those lines merge and blend. And I'm really grateful for that. I think the notion of these separate company types are starting to blend together a bit. And you're starting to see companies like Utsuka and BI and others really start to take on more of this internal development and partner with companies or acquire or whatever the case is, there's a lot of collaboration. Um, so that I think is one point. And the other point of interest is this notion around defining and distinguishing these. So I think this notion of you really can't be yourself unless there's a category of recognition for who you are. So um, as Zach mentioned, remote patient monitoring. There are codes in the United States for that, um, but digital therapeutics, we are still fighting for a benefit category. So these products can be recognized as a digital therapeutic and not have to fit into remote patient monitoring or telehealth or virtual care or whatever these others are. Uh, when you look at what Germany is doing with DIGA, it's a great Venn diagram. Not all DIGA are digital therapeutics, not all digital therapeutics are DIGA, but there's a great overlap there. So what I think we do need to see going forward, though, is this more of a harmonization notion around let's actually define what these are, categorize them, and then help the end user start to appropriately recognize and use these in those contexts. So it's been an evolution, but still a number of challenges ahead of us, too. 
So thank you for, for being so concise and thorough with your answer there. So let's talk a little bit about how COVID has affected things. We know that it's been a terrible situation for millions of people around the world. The numbers are staggering and uh, and nobody is uh, at all happy about the way that this has happened uh, and unfolded around the world. Uh, I think if there's any positive aspects of it, that, that it has enabled some opportunities for the health innovators to get an opportunity to come up off the bench and actually show what they can do. We've been talking about it for years, and now this is an opportunity for us to get on the field and actually show the impact we can have. So uh, before I go into to Zach and Yaziah about what they've seen, uh, how it's affected their businesses, what have you seen, Megan, from uh, sort of a global perspective as every country around the world has been affected by this and had various responses in terms of uh, how we can uh, solve and take care of, uh, solve the pandemic, but also take care of people with all the other conditions that they're, they're still dealing with, even in the wake of our, our hospitals being flooded with COVID patients? Well, you answered the question as your question as well as I could almost. Um, digital therapeutics have really shown their capacity to address the needs that are being raised right now. So you have scalable care that can be accessible in a patient's home environment. You don't have to expose patients to other uh, situations where they may not be able to travel to or go to while still being able to receive active care. Um, you're still providing clinicians with actionable data and insights. So it's the notion of being able to really extend a clinician or an employer or a payer or decision maker's ability to care for and treat patients in the context of their own environment using these clinically validated software products. So what we've seen is traumatic to say the least in what COVID has done uh, and all of its impacts, but we've also been able to see that digital therapeutics have been really made for this occasion in many of these regards. And I think they're long-term horizon though is really strong knowing that rural health patients don't always get the care they need and underserved populations, patients with undertreated diseases don't always have access to this care. And digital therapeutics can actually meet those unmet needs in a way that I think policymakers and payers are starting to be like, oh yeah, there's something here. And even clinicians are embracing this. Um, and then patients we've seen uptake uh, with a lot of enthusiasm. So uh, a lot to be done yet, but a lot has been accomplished. And I think a lot has been revealed in this process. Are we seeing, uh, you mentioned in your previous answer about reimbursements. I mean, for, for telemedicine, for example, uh, reimbursement opened right up. I mean, we've seen 10 years of, of uh, advancement in, a, in a, a few weeks, you know, mm -hmm. things that, that were restricted in terms of licensing issues and reimbursement issues and, you know, uh, in-person delivery of services just vanishing because the friction became so high that people were forced to change. Are we seeing that at all in the COVID, uh, in the wake of the COVID epidemic where things have, are so bad that we have to find ways to resource this and the money is opening up where the regulatory pathways are opening up. If you can think of any examples, if not, we'll, we'll move along. Yeah, really quickly on that. The regulatory side, I do believe is really open. I haven't seen too many barriers and we've also seen South Korea create the first ever regulatory pathway for digital therapeutics due to COVID. Uh, we've seen Japan open up their pathways. So there's been a lot of effort made on the regulatory side that I'm really proud of. On the payment side, United States is a good example of it. Uh, we don't have a benefit category. So Medicare and Medicaid don't have a way to recognize these products formally. So patients on the private side of the payer system are gaining access to these. Public side, not as much because there's no way to recognize it unless they again, try to fit themselves into a pre-existing benefit category. So that has been a challenge and will continue to be um, one that DTA were really supportive of trying to make this happen really for all the reasons we discussed earlier. Great. Lauren, I want to come to you. Thank you, Megan. Lauren, I want to come to you next. Was the, the title of this session is around clinically validated in, innovation. And as a biotech, as a life science company, uh, we know that we put a lot of trust and faith in, in these organizations to uh, make sure that they're producing good data. And that's been very much in the headlines over the past 12, uh, 12 months. We're seeing conversations around clinical trials uh, at uh, you know in families and around dinner tables uh, and on news programs that we never would have had you know 18 months ago. So when you take a look from your perspective or from your industry perspective, uh, you know either if you want to answer it from your your uh, from Ipsen's perspective or from the industry, when you take a look at clinically validated innovation, um, particularly for the the startups that are the early stage businesses that are on the call with us here, uh, and for the ones that are listening, what sorts of things are you looking for? What are what are the sorts of ways that you do assess that these are good partners for you to work with and how can they best prepare themselves to be an attractive partner for an organization like yours? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, I think 
what I often call um, the, the one P of my five P's is proof. And that's uh, broadly three types of validation that is really important to us as a pharma. There's for sure starting with clinical validation. Then there is also the regulatory and commercial validation. So just going quickly on the, on the other two before coming back to clinical, uh, on commercial sides, right? Usually you guys know very well, uh, working with pharma sometimes takes time, right? It, navigating the organization, the contracting process can already take time. And we do want, to, when we identify on that patient, the physician or peer need, we do want to address that need quickly. So it, it helps a lot if a solution has been proven on the market with proven demand, uh, whether that's direct to consumer or through the employers or health plans, uh, just the, the seeing the level of uh, signups, the level of onboarding, the level of engagement of users on the platform, that uh, is a way for us to, to shortcut so that we can, we know that if we go to market with a partner, it's likely going to take up, right? And then the regulatory side too, I often talk about it uh, as a differentiator. I think Megan, it's props to uh, DTA for the work you guys have been doing, opening up that channel. Um, I think for, uh, if we look at digital therapeutics on the market, especially in the US, there are a few strategies. There are the ones who just stay with wellness, very much want to not, not touch the regulatory pathway. And then you have uh, folks who uh, have the, the courage and ambition to pursue it. And you know, they will go through a 510K process or if FDA decides they, can, they, they don't need to, it's under enforcement discretion, but they make the effort nonetheless. Um, I think for us, it is very encouraging to see a company willing to embrace the regulatory pathway. Uh, and the rigor that's behind pursuing the pathway, I think it is a very good indication for the quality of the underlying clinical evidence. Um, so we do appreciate that a lot. Uh, so going back to, okay, clinical validation, uh, you're, you're spot on, right? As drug companies, we take a lot of pride in, uh, and discipline in our drugs clinical process. Um, and for digital therapeutics too, having a really robust uh, randomized control trial uh, is still the gold standard for us. So companies who have uh, had RCTs, uh, ideally even multiple in publications, that to us is a really strong vote of confidence um, for the impact they're ultimately going to help us bring uh, together to our patients. Um, so that's why it's important to us uh, and we always encourage companies to not shy away from that in the way it's a big differentiator. All that sounds expensive, frankly. I, I understand the reason why you're looking for it, but as an early stage business, as an innovator, uh, Josiah, I wanted to come to you. Uh, and you're, you started your company five years ago. You've established this partner with Sanofi. We've heard from Lauren about some of the things that they're looking for. It sounds like an expensive investment of time and money uh, to be able to build up for that. How does that? How does her answer sort of match your experience as you were developing your your partnership with Sanofi? And and what can you tell us about that? Um, you you definitely need strong partners and and money if you want to build a successful digital therapeutics company because you're kind of treated like a pharma company but without the deep pockets. <laughs> so you're in this kind of stretch position um, where you have to fulfill all the regulatory and all the um, yeah, the um, evidence requirements without um, the, um, yeah, the, the, the same resources. Um, so it's, it's lots of fun to, to kind of be in this challenge. Um, the partnership with Sanofi, for example, really helped us with um, creating awareness around digestive diseases. So we, for example, produced TV spots where we actually um, yeah, presented the two products together as a kind of as a team, um, as a holistic program for patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And there are worldwide around 12% um, um, of the world population suffer from IBS. So um, this was a huge um, huge huge um, uh, breakthrough for us because we wouldn't have done those TV commercials in the UK and Germany, but with our partnership, we could do that. And we currently also have similar partnerships in the pipeline, um, especially for Germany, where we now have to also convince doctors to prescribe us, which is very, very yeah, expensive and a very slow um, process. 
And I think um, there are companies, especially in the life science um, field, um, that have lots of experience with that. Why should we, um, yeah, um, yeah, be in kind of a competing position with them? But we could also kind of use these synergies and work together and kind of, yeah, put our portfolios together and, and convince doctors with, um, yeah, with, with both products. And this is kind of our so, approach. I beg your pardon. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Have I interrupted your your answer there? No. Okay, you're all good. Okay, so let's pick up on that point about about who's buying and, and how do you sell it? Because we obviously need the technology to work. We need the regulatory pathways uh, to to be able to to certify the the uh, clinical validation that the companies have gone through. We need to be able to find ways to get things reimbursed or paid for and involve the other stakeholders that are uh, the, the sort of gatekeepers to the innovation. But how do you actually go out and get this sold? Uh, uh, Zach, I wanted to come to you with Gluco uh, because you know these things are very much b2c but our industry is very much focused on b2b you know working through the various channels and the, and the doctors the care providers that are uh saying what what a person should have when they're sitting across the, the table or at the at the bedside with them so how do you actually go about and get this used by the people who have an option or to do nothing uh or to ask to use your product that's a great question. Um, I, I think for most of the digital health companies, the remote patient monitoring companies, there's uh, several different channels. But um, to your point, one of them certainly isn't buying CNN ads uh, at, at a very high price point because we don't typically go um, B to C uh, in, in large scale. We, we may go B to B to C, uh, and, and that's some of what uh, Josiah was referring to. So our strategy, and it kind of ties on to the conversation about partners, is to use a mix of both direct sales uh, in different countries, but also uh, partnerships with life sciences companies, um, in our case, such as Novo Nordisk or Insulate, um, as well as uh, other third parties who might um, offer other pieces of the solution, like nurse educators or health coaches. And so via th these different partnerships, we can amplify our reach. Uh, you know, our expansion into 26 countries didn't happen completely organically on our own um, means. We leveraged the sales forces, for instance, of our partners to carry in the combined package of say, Gluco and the Novo Nordisk solution or Gluco and the Insulate solution. And in the end, you know, we complement what they're doing because we're, we're not going to be making insulin pumps or insulin pins uh, or, or CGMs, but we are going to build a very nice a digital health solution that complements that and uh, is somewhat of the back end. So in doing so, their sales teams around the world can bring the combined package, as, as Josiah mentioned, into the um, healthcare practitioner's offices or, uh, in whatever country they're in, and it's presented and it's delivered together. So we have to think creatively uh, to, uh, on our go-to-market strategy to do that. That said, there's still certain markets where it makes a lot of sense for us to uh, sell directly and go to market directly. So in our case, in the United States, we sell directly to health systems because we have the full solution for them and we can more tightly control the message of the value and help them understand the reimbursement dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a blend uh, for certain, but uh, you, you, you really need to work with partners uh, to gain the, the scale and the leverage. Yeah, that, that's a really great point. So a big part, go ahead, jump please. I a little bit uh, on Zach's point, uh, I fully agree. I think the, the part about pharma life sciences uh, being able to combine forces, I think that's one that can be explored further because pharma do have usually a costly and large sales force. And as we see in the virtual setting, everyone's trying to grapple how to more efficiently leverage that sales force. And uh, yeah, in my prior years in biotech, I've carried the bag of being a sales rep before. I know a lot of sales reps always are dying to get something new to talk to their physicians about, right? So when you have something exciting, a new solution, that, that's motivating for the sales force too. 
and I've also done work in marketing, you, you do want to regularly push out new material that the sales force can use, that the physicians can engage in, because every time we go into the physician office, they're going to ask, Lauren, what's new today? <laughs> and usually there isn't much, right? So I think there, there is a, a really interesting opportunity there. Um, the other thing, just to an earlier point about clinical trials that you mentioned, yes, clinical RCTs are expensive. Um, so just to set expectations, for sure, a pharma company, at least we are not expecting a digital therapeutic company to spend, you know, five years, multiple millions, like a pharma drug trial. Um, I do think by the nature, the me uh, mechanism of action of a digital therapeutic, the length of the trial uh, that's required and the size of the trial is different. Um, so, you know, you're a lot of the RCTs we see are a few weeks, right? Maybe it's a you know, eight week program or it's a 16 week program. Um, and it's you know, a few hundred or a couple thousand of patients. That can be sufficient and quite uh, powerful for I think a zero therapeutics RCT that wouldn't be the case, wouldn't be sufficient for a drug trial for because of the reason of the, the mechanism of actions and, and the, the risks. So I, I don't want to set unrealistic uh, expectations that we want you guys to have millions of dollars of, uh, in your pocket to fund those trials. We're, we're not looking for that either. Yeah, thanks. I was actually going to come to you next, Lauren. So thanks for adding uh, your perspective there, because I think as we've heard from Isaiah and Zach, it's, it's a blend uh, about how you need to go to market with this. And it fundamentally transforms the relationship for an organization like yours. This goes mm -hmm. far beyond what Zach uh, his partnership with uh, Nova Nordis, for example, uh, you know, with Nova Nordis, if you go to the pharmacy and get uh, an insulin pen, uh, the best relationship they have with the person who gets that is if they fill out a warranty card or not. But when they have a relationship through an organization like Gluco, they have a far more relevant uh, relationship, a far more uh, relevant relationship for the, for the patient and with the patient and a lot more data that also can help inform the decisions that they're making. But all that goes back to one of the points you made earlier, Lauren, in terms of the usability, because we can get into these sort of echo chambers sometimes, I think, in, in the healthcare field, and we can talk about what they out there need to do, and we can come together and talk about digital therapeutics, and we all are on board with the need for this, but it's the people out there doing the work, taking care of themselves, taking care of their family members, taking care of their patients, that we really need to make sure that they have the information that, that's needed, like you were alluding to, uh, teaching physicians, but also teaching the nurses, the people who are there at the front lines that have been so important during this COVID crisis, uh, that, that we inform them so they can help guide those those uh, patients along the way. We're almost out of time. I just uh, I want to thank all of you, first of all, for participating. I want to go around quickly and ask you, we're almost at the start of the year. It's just the beginning of February, so we have a long 2021 ahead of us. The bar is set pretty low after 2020, so the, hopefully this is going to be a much better year. Uh, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to or things that are going to be announced, whether, whether it's within your company or within the industry? I'll start with Isaiah. Uh, we'll go to Zach and then Lauren, and we'll end up with Megan. If you could just give me a, a really quick answer about what this year is going to hold uh, for the industry or your, or your company. Yeah, thanks. I really enjoyed the, the round here. Um, so we're currently looking actually for, um, you know, we're hiring a lot. Um, we are looking for partnerships, especially when it comes to employers, health plans, um, health systems, life science companies, especially in Germany. So yeah, if you're out there, um, reach out to me. Great. How do they get a hold of you? Um, you can just um, type in my name and LinkedIn and then um, ping me there or um, Uzziah at Cara.care. Yes, Uzziah Brinkman, B-R-I-N-K-M-A-N. I think I got that right, right? Exactly. Okay. So quickly, Zach, uh, what about you for 2021? What do we have in store? Yep. 2021 is going to be a, a very high growth year. Um, just from what we saw uh, last year, it, it actually accelerated our business quite a bit. Um, and in Q4, it was the largest bookings quarter by far we ever had. And it's because people are more rapidly embracing um, digital health and RPM technologies, very much to the trends Megan was speaking about, we saw it in spades, especially at the tail end of last year. So because of that, we have a lot of momentum going into this year, and we're going to double down on, on that opportunity and really expand our teams globally. Uh, so similar to right. Josiah's uh, situation, we we are hiring. Um, so please, please reach out. Excellent. Um, Great. But, Let but me just important. interrupt you there. We're, we're out of time here. So I just need to go quickly then to Lauren, 10 seconds from Lauren and 10 seconds from Megan, anything that you guys are looking forward to in 2021, then we're out of time. Sure. Yes. 
Um, we're also hiring. Uh, my team in Digital Hall is, is hiring for anyone who have good project managers. Uh, and then my company, Ibsen, has a few in, a very exciting launches uh, in the rare disease space. So we're excited to potentially be able to bring a new cure for patients. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lauren. And, and Megan, how about for you? All right, we're going to see consistency in payer frameworks grow. We need to see harmonized regulatory frameworks expand. Uh, we're going to see clinician uptake and clinicians embracing these products, and then patient utilization be proved via real world outcomes and data endpoints. Excellent. Well, if we were in person in London, I'd ask everybody to give you all a big round of applause. I'll give you one myself right now, and I'll turn back over to Becky to carry on with the rest of the program. Thank you all for participating, and I hope uh, the audience enjoyed what it is that you had to share. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you so much. Um, sorry we had to race through things at, uh, at the end there, um, as is always the way with these conversations. Um, I'm sure we could have uh, spoken about that for, for hours. So thank you so much to everyone. Um, Megan actually touched upon there um, uh, something that our next panel um, will be discussing. So optimizing real world evidence and real world data. So I hope you can join us um, uh, back uh, at four o'clock for that. Um, but in the meantime, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, and I'll see you next time.